What's up, everyone? This is the Everyday Bow Hunter Podcast, and I'm your host, Mike Manley. This week, Dan and I are going to dive into a bunch of beginner mistakes that we've made and the lessons we've learned for it and the things that we do differently now. We're going to talk about our bow setups, arrows, uh, scouting, uh, spot selection for our hunting spots, talk about winds and scent control, dive into a bunch of different hunting stories about things that we really screwed up and how they changed the way we hunt now. So if you want to dive into that with us, you want to learn about a ton of things that you can do better based on the mistakes that we made, then this episode is for you. So join me now and let's go. Welcome to the Everyday Bow Hunter. I'm your host, Mike Manley, retired Green Beret turned bow hunter, joined by my brother, Dan Zima. We're here to share tips, stories, and talk gear, all from our unique points of view. Whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned bow hunter, I think you're going to like it. So let's go. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is episode six of the podcast, and uh, we'll jump jump right into it. Dan, what was, what was your last two weeks like? It seems uh, like a long two weeks. Yeah, it's been pretty busy. Well, we did the Lebanon Dog Show. I'm going to start out by saying I don't really care for indoor dog shows. It's so freaking loud. I mean, <laughs> all little yap yap dogs and whatever. It's so loud. Uh, Mom and dad came up. It was pretty cool. They got to see, uh, Natalie, uh, go, go select and make it to group, uh, through, uh, owner handler. So that was pretty cool. She, she placed there all four days. She placed awesome. in group two of the four days, which she got, I think five points towards her grand champ. Well, towards the dogs grand champion. Uh, it was pretty, uh, productive weekend. It was a, a lot of work. That's awesome. Better than you yeah. and me. That would drive me crazy. <laughs> and then. Last night, I went to a 90s party, themed party, and I, I'm official. It's official now. I'm a champion of beer pong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was smoking these jokers. Mm. <laughs> See, this is where being an archer comes in handy. It's like laser precision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. 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 <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, what are you doing? I got some stuff to tell you. Which half of it already but the uh, listeners obviously don't so uh anything else archery wise you've done this this oh, past did, two weeks i did do some shooting uh i had to get i took all the back seats out of my truck and put a platform in for the dog crate and all that stuff for dog shows for traveling i had to get that all set back up and whatnot because archer season coming get prepared but i did do some shooting uh shooting a little better than it was the last time i got a Last time I, I almost lost confidence and it, it felt good to get out there and have some productive sessions that mm -hmm. really builds you right back up. And every, yeah, every, you need important. that. You got to have it. Yeah. I've gone in the season before not feeling very confident. And that's, that's bad when you're, when you're in the tree, you're not confident in what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've definitely dealt with that. I guess we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, the, uh, last two weeks have been, pumping out a bunch of uh, video content really man i'm i'm about videoed out right now with all i've recorded but gonna have a lot, a lot of that coming to the channel soon uh i was pretty stoked i uh, talked with uh Ozio gear if you don't know about Ozio gear they're uh bow hunting clothes company specifically for bow hunters did you like the hand signals dan but yeah. uh <laughs> 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 um, but so I, I've reviewed a bunch of their stuff before, and they're going to send me some uh, late season gear to test out. So I'm pretty, pretty psyched about that. Hopefully I'm still uh, not hunting in the late season, but it'll be nice to, to have some cold weather gear. You know how cold it can get in no November anyway. So yeah. Also uh, a rep from marketing rep that represents both Ozonics and Sika contacted me and they're, they're talking about setting me up with some Ozonics to hunt with and uh, some additional Sika gear, which of course I'll never turn down some new Sika gear. No. And uh, uh, never never even considered the Ozonics thing because that was just another piece of gear to carry in the woods and not really knowing how reliable it is. Like I think the one unit that they're talking about sending me is like 500 bucks. I definitely am not one to drop 500 bucks on that. 
you yeah. know, something I never even thought about or considered, but if you're going to ask me to test it, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to do a good test yeah, and uh, see how it goes. So we'll see okay. what happens with that. So I'm pretty I like, stoked about that. I do like the idea of the car thing and the bag. Uh, that looks pretty like legit. Yeah. Having a, uh, it's a small unit that this is the micro, I think, uh, for the car. And then, um, there's a, it's called like a dry bag. And, uh, well, you could hook that Ozonic unit to the dry bag and do what's called a dry wash on your clothes. Although there's some hunting clothes that say that it's not good to use Ozonics on them for whatever treatment they have on them or something. So something to look into too. Yeah. But anyway, it'll be interesting to test and see sometimes with that or rehunt that it's feast or famine on deer. You don't know if it's working or not. Sometimes it's only if you got something coming in downwind of you, you're saying, man, how can that deer not smell me right now? Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to get too, uh, too fired up about it until it happens though. So anyway, that was great. And, uh, I've been really messing with the gear, but today I working on my kayak trailer, putting that together. I only have to put the actual kayak mounts on now. It's been a real pain, but anyway, uh, I think some of the stuff you were, you were talking about with shooting your bow and stuff and, and feeling confident and stuff goes in, really leads into what we're talking about today. And that's, uh, beginner mistakes to avoid or lessons learned that we've had things that we've done wrong and what we've done to correct it. And that is kind of, I don't know. I think even from last year to this year, I was started filming my hunts last year and then this year. I'm like changed half of what I did because I was like, oh, I, this doesn't work. I have to change things up and make it lighter and, and better and stuff. So learning lessons all the time, but yeah. let's start off with your, your bow prep, your arrows and your, and your shooting and, and talk through some of the mistakes you made and, and what you, what you've done to request, uh, yeah, what you've done to correct it. Well, me personally, I'll say this. I, I had a great mentor with dad. So the, the shooting part, I really didn't make a lot of mistakes more than like, as far as like the purchase, bought a brand new Matthews bow, got some really great arrows right off the bat with that, uh, and went with the grim reaper broadheads and like, I, I, I feel like I did all the right things there, but it was really for me, it was about the consistency in shooting and, and training with that and learning how to do that the right way. And, and I ain't even gonna lie. It took a couple seasons for me to get kind of into the flow of what I should really be doing. And if you're just starting out and you don't have that mentor, like I did, Mike, you were away, me and my, my our friend, my, one of my best friends, Jevin, we kind of were into stuff we shouldn't have been into. And we're like, Hey, we need to we need to change our life here a little bit. Let's, let's get into archery hunting. My dad talks about how great it is and whatever. And so me and him kind of made a pack together, went, bought, both bought the same Matthews adrenaline bow, got ours, got set up and we started hunting together and we had, you know, each other to kind of you know, watch each other. Like it's always good to have somebody watch what you're doing, your mechanics, you're dropping your elbow or you're this or that. And I think it's important to have somebody watch it. And if you don't get a camera, see what, that, that kind of thing. And if you don't have that ability, just keep practice and oh, keep it in your head. Like do it like a three-step process. Okay. Draw, make sure elbows up level release, follow through that whole thing. And you got to keep practicing that it's, it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. So what year was that? Did you guys started? Oh my gosh. I always forget. I do too. I, uh, was it late to, to late to that 2007, I believe. Oh, seven. Yeah. So one, two, one, two long before, before I retired in 2010. Right. No, it was, yeah, it wasn't that long. Uh, but, but until you got home, I had in those couple of years, I had figured some stuff out. It took, I just was in a different place then. And I was so impatient. I mean, I still have that today, but the impatience in me, but I was a very impatient person. And it took me a while to really just 
get, find my Zen, so to speak, to, to be calm enough to shoot properly and eat, everything else follows from that point forward. You first, you build your confidence and then it's, you're going to figure out your mistakes, which we're going to get into with gear. You're going to figure out your mistakes with your scouting and all that stuff. And, but I, I mean, personally for me, I think as a beginner, the first thing you do, the scouting and all that, that that's all secondary. The shooting is the most important thing because of ethics, because of not wounding an animal, getting that dialed in is I think to me, the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's very important. Knowing your, knowing your weapon and how you're, how you're, how you're shooting down range and the, the ethics behind it. And I talk about for me making sure that, that i I try to keep my shot with 30 yards or less. And that's not necessarily because I can't shoot farther. It's, it's one of the things that, you know, as far as the tracking problem I have in my eyes with, with the TBI stuff is I don't want to screw up and wound a deer because I'm trying to take a longer shot. May I, might, might I take a 35 yard shot or a 40 yard shot? It's really situational, but I try to keep myself in that, that 30 yard or less window, uh, just because of, of not wanting to do that and, and be ethical about it. Well, from 30 to 40 yards, Mike, a lot can happen. Uh, that, that, that distance there with, with, especially with deer jumping the arrow. Now, if you're a beginner, the deer jumping the arrow, the farther the distance, it, they have more of an opportunity and you're going to see them. They kind of duck down first and then they jump. So they're going to, they're going to swoop on that arrow. That's a huge thing. And that's why Mike's saying, yeah, you jump gotta, the string. You, you got, you only practice up 20, 30 yards. I think a beginner, you shouldn't be shooting over 30 yards in the game, unless you're like a, the world's most amazing guy, guy behind a bow. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah. And I know a lot of, a lot of guys out West, they take those yeah. 40, 50, 60 yard shots. But if you're taking a 60 yard shot, a lot of times that deer is not even going to hear that arrow. If you have the right setup. Yeah, because and a lot of, of times too, that's with an elk and stuff like that's a lot larger of an animal. When yeah. You're talking a lot more about surface white area. Dale small. But yeah. Yep. I mean, I, I actually purposely aim just a little low if, if I think they're on edge. Yep. I try to aim a little low because I expect them to drop and it wouldn't possibly jump to string. Although I've, I've literally seen them jump like that when a stick falls out of the tree. Yeah. They just kind of jump. And yeah. Well, they they do that. drop and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They do that. So now for me on the bow side of things, whoo, man, when I started off, Dan, it was bad. It was bad. So I think I said this in podcast before, but I started off. I bought a bear, bear archery bow. I don't, it's sitting over here right now. I, I could go look at, I don't even know what the name of it was. And, uh, it, it might've thrown an arrow 190 feet per <laughs> second <laughs> with like my draw. Telephone poles. <laughs> yeah. It was a whew, big arc. So, uh, I used to remember, <laughs> remember you, you and the old man, we'd be out doing 3d shoots and, and he was like. Man, that thing's barely penetrating the target. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> the birds were only going in like that far. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe I actually killed a deer with that, but what happens? So, but, uh, the, yeah, I mean, that was a huge mistake. I knew nothing about, but I didn't have the, the mentor thing. And I was kind of coming in, just not knowing anything about archery. I was just kind of, well, I don't want to. I don't want to buy the most expensive thing. Cause I don't know how, if I'm going to like it or whatever mm -hmm. arrows I'd said before, I thought it was the weight on the side of the arrow. I didn't knew nothing about spine or spine deflection and how that impacts how the arrow flies, what fletchings do, how the broadhead affects the flight of the arrow. Knew none of that. I bought that foe and, uh, the arrows I bought were what's that shop down there in East prospect. Oh, uh, layman's layman's. That's where yeah. me and Jeb, that's where me and Jevin bought our, our Matthews adrenaline bows in that shop. Yeah. Well, I went, the first arrows I bought, uh, were, they came, well, actually came with the bow on eBay. And once I got them, I was like, I, I was afraid to even use them. They were, they just looked sh uh, sh shady, just wouldn't look right. Yeah. So when I went down there, uh, the, the guy at layman's there set me T up with Tony. some arrows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tony set me up with arrows, uh, made sure my bow is good. I had him check it out and everything. And it got me all, 
uh, G'd up with my bow sight and stuff like mm -hmm. that, because obviously I didn't know. So that's a beginner lesson there. Go to your local bow shop, your archery pro, let them look over your bow, make sure it's tuned, help you out, get it set up. Don't try to do it yourself. If you don't try, you can watch videos and stuff all day long, but that experience that guy has in the shop yeah. is going to make a world of difference and do it fast. And you're sitting here struggling with it. He's going to take it in, keep the bow overnight, maybe. And get it back in tomorrow. In some cases, well, I, I've gone up here to extreme archery and getting this, this stuff back right away. Yeah. Arrows, that's a whole that, other animal. We could do a whole show on the mistakes with, with arrows and yeah. not understanding that the weight of your arrow is, is important. You can shoot a, everybody focuses on, when I, I swap, I'm guilty. What I focused on initially was speed. I wanted to have a fast arrow because I'm watching you. The old man shoot their, your bows and it's like whack, whack. And they're just drilling the target. I mean, you're getting yeah. great penetration, yeah. everything we're shooting. And I'm like, man, I'm not even getting half of that. I need to do yeah. something. You know? Yeah. It's and discouraging I, when you're watching other people be successful and you know what your faults are. It's like, you got to make a change, but yeah. you got to do you something. Have to, you have to learn that your setup is different than everybody else's. Yep. I mean, unless you have somebody that has the same draw length as you shooting the same draw weight, has the same yep. bow then and same arrows, then you're going to shoot the same. Yep. But if not, it's going to be different because every bow has a different speed dynamic. The draw length changes that draw weight changes that. So yep. now that, that I all, know all that, now that I know all that stuff, yeah. when I go out, I feel really confident. Well, a lot of that changed like, for you when you went and got that Hoyt. It's, that was like a totally different animal for you. And you, you could see that's when you really started getting into archery and you started building confidence and you started killing on a regular basis and yeah. kudos to Hoyt. They make a good bow, but it, a good quality bow the, goes a long way, but it really does. That was the vector turbo because yeah. I mean, I have a short draw length. I need as much speed as I can get because as soon as if you put my draw length on there, man, it, the, the speed goes down quite a bit. So I need, yeah. I need all the speed I can get. Um, in fact, I'm probably, I'm probably going to move to another bow next year, but I'm happy with, uh, with my setup this year right now. Arrows, I'm happy with my broadheads. I'm happy with everything. But through the years, I was always kind of a fixed blade guy. I did use the Toxics for quite a while. Yeah. The, the Toxic broadhead, it actually looks like the Toxic symbol. Uh, they, like the biohazard like symbol. Yeah, yeah, biohazard, yeah. Yeah, biohazard yeah, symbol. Yeah, yeah. And, they're, and uh, I'll tell you what, they, Mike, they, that, they that freaking big buck kill. you got, that big buck you got, oh my, did it ever put a hurting on that thing. It destroyed oh, him. Jesus, it destroyed it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so I, I can't complain about the Toxic. I, that they did a heck of a job. But we, the shoot and I changed to the, the Trocar there. And... Mm. And this year I'm going to shoot the, uh, oh my God. Tooth of the arrow. I'm going to try tooth of the arrows, broadheads and, uh, the iron world. No, I'm not using the iron world. Remember they didn't fit in my, I sold them. Oh what's yeah, that's using? right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're oh. using, it's, it's, it's escaping me. Right here. It's the, oh, uh, yeah. I don't know why I can't think of the name in the package is right there. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Black oh, Hornet. Oh, Magnus. Black Hornets. Magnus yeah. Black Hornets just came to me. My Magnus God. is what I was looking for. But if you're yeah, listening yeah, to this, yeah, yeah. sorry about that, man. I, yeah. wow, I had total mind fart. But hey, yeah, that, it's summertime Magnus, and Hornets. we all got like a million things going on right now. <laughs> it's, it's oh yeah. So, but yeah. So, but yeah. And, and I guess one of the bigger lessons for me when it comes to shooting, because you talked about shooting, yeah. is we used to shoot 3D shoots all the time. And man, I yeah. just felt really confident about it. And I, and I haven't done that, but the other thing that I've learned and I really feel good about this year is I was just shooting my field tips to get ready yeah. for the season and the same way, you know, as your, as your normal, as your broadheads, but I wasn't shooting the actual broadheads that I was going to shoot and yeah. huge mistake. That's a huge, huge mistake. beginner mistake. Huge, huge, huge. You have to shoot your broadheads. Even if you have to buy an extra pack, yeah. you know, and shoot. Shoot those broadheads so you know, because they can be way off or they can be right, you know, right on. I was I lucky there. They're right on for me. Both the tooth of the arrow and the Magnus were perfect on. I didn't have to make any adjustments to my sight. I sights. have to say that. I think that other than you're, you're shooting for a beginner, that's one of the biggest mistakes a beginning archer makes is just practice with the field points. 
morning before you go out hunting, putting on a broad head of whatever and going out and thinking and hoping that it's, it's, it's not, you got to, Hey man, if you want to be an archer hunter, you got to do your due diligence and you got to put the time in it. it, It's just part of the game. And I know a lot of people do it, but starting in September is the wrong answer. August you can get away with, but if you shot for a while, but if you're just starting out, man, you need to really get, put some time behind that bow and and build that muscle memory. Cause it, when that time comes and a a big buck walks up in front of you, everybody, I don't care who you are. you see the seasoned guys on the hunting public, they, they all get shaken. You, mm-hmm. you get that buck fever and target panic we talked about before. And that, that's, that's some real deal, especially if it's a big, big buck and you're like, oh. So that's why having that muscle memory built up and that shooting was gonna, is going to help you muscle through that, hopefully. Yeah. I, I, another thing like this season is a little different for me. Uh, getting prepared for the season. I started working out, doing some kettlebell stuff, getting on the elliptical, doing some yoga, getting stretched out. Right. Like we're, we're hoofing it out into the mountains. And if you were successful, you got to drag a deer back. You guys saw in the episode prior, like that picture of me all blowed out and that, you know what that is? That was me 100% completely out of shape. And I, I, this year I told myself I'm going in a lot healthier than next year. I, it's, I owe it to myself and I owe it to the sport. It's yeah, I'm on the, the stair stepper at the gym four days a week. Plus my lift in, uh, that I built my shoulder back from, from the, I was really bad there for a while Yeah, and now it's back and I'm, I'm feeling really strong and good. So hopefully I'm good through the season here, but yeah, absolutely. Being in yeah. shape for it, especially just putting a tree stand on your back and heading up up in the woods just you know going back for miles or whatever and then having to drag a deer back with all your gear too yeah you're, you're not leaving your gear there you got to take that out so that's i'll, a, I'll tell that's, you what i it, it helped me actually build stamina for shooting like i noticed that the last two days shooting you know just going through shooting more and more and more arrows like it it's becoming easier because i'm starting to build muscle in that area and I'm like, holy crap, I'm actually seeing the rewards of it. That's, it's great. I love it. Yeah. I told you that last time I shot, I shot like 60 arrows and I couldn't believe yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you build that, build that up for that one, that one shot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes in a season, that's all you're going to get. It's, it, it could. So, so what have we got here next, Dan? Oh, uh, well, we're, Going into beginner mistakes, early season scouting, and hunting spot selection. So okay, go get. Oh it. man, in the beginning, <laughs> again, I had, I had it easy because I had my dad as a mentor, and he would just he literally knew all the good hunt spots. He had been out there hunting for years prior to me and Jevin coming up hunting. So. He would literally put me in a spot. They're going to come through here at this time. And damned if he wasn't right every time they would be coming up over the mountain or this or that. But once I started going, you know what? I I want to prove to him that I can do this without him. I I, I got to do this on my own for my own ego, testicle reasons. But but man, I screwed up so many times because I would just... I'd see a deer trail that was like hi- historical and I'd just go up, no fresh deer crap, no nothing. And I would just hunt these spots and I went years without killing an animal because I was just doing all the wrong things when it came to scouting. Oh, I could shoot something, but I wasn't putting myself in them right places. I was just out there. Yeah. It's beautiful to sit in the woods. But it's frustrating (laughs) when you're not seeing the animals and I was not doing my homework. I was not playing the wind. I was not, I didn't care about my scent, but back then I had spent all my money on my bow because that Matthew's adrenaline was completely set up. We're talking $1,200, blah, blah, blah. There, there went, I shot my load. So (laughs) I didn't, I didn't have the money for all the scent gear. So I was just using all my old hunting clothes. Yeah. I, dude, I screwed up every way possible. Dad would put me in these wonderful spots. I'd have deer come in and I wouldn't be ready. I wouldn't, it's just, 
you name it, I did it wrong. And it took me till a couple years ago with me changing my style of hunting from getting out of a tree is when I really just screw the BS. I'm doing this the right way every time. And it, everything's well thought out now. I think that's it. That's the number one thing. Yeah. Having a plan. Walking yeah. out in the woods without a plan is, is the wrong answer. Yeah. Um, you got to say, like, I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago. You talk about, you're going to scout and find that hot sign. Mm -hmm. Find, find some spots where you have, you put out trail cameras or something, or you just, just go and work your way through the woods or, or near ag or whatever, and, and see where that sign is, is pointing. Early season, you'll find that, that food to bed pattern that they're on and when they're doing it and put yourself on that, on that trail that's between the two and you might be successful, but understanding, I mean, I think I went out and I think my first hunt, I've, well, let's go back to scouting real quick. So my son, Tyler and I are down near the lake and I, we find all this deer sign and and he's like, oh my God, dad, this trail's so good. It's, it's deer Vegas. We follow the trail in and, and sure enough, that's a highway. It is a highway and it was a doe highway, but it's still a highway. It's good, good rut funnel too. But we end up calling it hangover hollow. <laughs> <laughs> the easy I know it spot well. to get to. <laughs> the easy spot to get to. Yeah. The easy spot to get to when you don't feel like walking far. But yep. you know, we went. We went in other, other areas there and found, I found a tremendous amount of trails and deer, deer sign, not nest, no rubs really, uh, just, you know, deer scat and, and trails and it's a cattle path. That, yeah. Yeah. And I, it, I went now remember that I just picked a tree that was, that was next to the trails. I didn't think about wind I didn't think about any of that. And I go and I put myself down there and I. I go down, I get in the tree and this go, I'll talk more about this when I get to equipment, but I get in the tree and it probably takes me an hour to get set up. I am just all screwed up, but then gets light. It's barely getting light. And I have literally all of a sudden there's 12 deer around me, my mamas and little ones, little ones are running around my tree, jumping on each other's backs <laughs> and stuff. And I'm like. I can't move because, <laughs> because I was a chucklehead and I ended up only being 12 foot feet up and I'm in the middle of the opening open area. When you go in there, the dark, <laughs> yeah, I thought yeah. I was in the right tree. I wasn't in the right tree. I was in one tree over <laughs> and, and I'm like, I can't move. And I, I was sitting down, which I should have been standing up with the first thing in the morning like that. Big lesson learned. Don't be on. If you can shoot in the seated position. Great. If yeah. you can't. You need to be standing up for the witching hour that those first, that first hour, definitely after it gets light and, and before, before the sun goes down, you need to be up on your feet, ready to go. If you're in a tree stand and man, I was sitting down. And when I did stand up, yeah. they were gone. Mike, I was, I, on, on that, like you can, you can have a mentor, but that only takes you so far. It's following through with the process. Once you're alone and to your own device, it, it changes everything. And you, and you find a spot, you think you're going to the right place and you do something like that. And I think you just nailed a great point is the timing of you being ready. Uh, for me, that's where I made the majority of my mistakes was not being ready. Uh, go to draw busted, go to stand up busted ever. It seemed like everything I did. I was getting busted or this or that. And I was like, I got to a point where I was like, is it ever going to happen for me? This is yeah. madness. Like, yeah. th this is too hard. This is too hard. Well, no, I was making it too hard. Self-inflicted wounds are the worst ones. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really tried to over the years become, and it's been a slow, slow go. It's just become more and more of a woodsman. And we do this a lot. And I think, I think, uh, I think we're all pretty good at, good at it going out there and identifying the sign and stuff and the direction of travel and the trails and, and be able to cut a track and get on it and stuff and, tra mm -hmm. and track that stuff down. But that stuff doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you have to dedicate yourself to being a, a woodsman 
no one. Okay. What kind of tree is this? Is it oak tree? Is that, is that a, a mass producing acorn producing tree? Yep, yep. They, what is this stuff over here? Something that deer eat? Because yeah. I mean, if you can be near fresh sign, it's also near food yeah. and near bedding at the same time. All those things can really be, that can be a great spot to be in. But if you don't know that and you don't make yourself a student of the game, then you're really be in trouble. And that's why I said, we talked about previously about having that plan. And I mean, we, we would go out, we had all these spots named. The mistake was to go out to that spot, sit in it because this is a morning spot. Why is it a morning spot? Because, well, the deer are coming off, off of water and heading back to bed. And this is that travel route. I mean, sometimes you see them, see them, but most of the time, doe really most of the time doe yeah um although you know during the rut's a whole different animal during during the rut's a whole different animal i think that really changes everything but um just going out to those spots over and over again and i i think it was like three years ago four years ago i started getting dis dis disgruntled and not and saying i need to i need to be a, a better student of the game and you know, yeah. I was doing all the little stuff, trying different things, making mock scrapes, doing, doing different things like that. Just trying to test out and see how the deer reacted to stuff, trying to learn more about deer behavior and, yeah. and their, and their, their, their habitat and their, their movement patterns and stuff and try to understand that. And that my biggest mistake in the, the beginning years was, was not doing that. Yeah. You know? I, I agree with that. I think a lot of people, their misconception when they start archery hunting is that they don't realize how different it is compared to rifle hunting. Oh yeah. In rifle hunting, there's so much hunting pressure and the, the deer are just running every which way with their tongues hanging out because of all the hunters in the woods. Archery, they are in their own element, their natural element, and it's totally different. And you have, it, the game is totally different because of that specifically. You and know, go ahead. Just to interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Uh, Yesterday, or yeah, yesterday or the day before, uh, Dwayne Diffenbach is a professor. My son's in the, the uh, wildlife uh, and fishery, wildlife management uh, de degree program at Penn State. And his, one of the professors up there is Dwayne Diffenbach, and he is uh, the head of this huge deer study. They have over a thousand collared deer in central oh, yeah. and north central PA. And I listened to him a little bit on a the podcast he was on because they had a study get released in Lancaster online. I'll see if I can find it and put it in the, in the show notes so, so the listeners can read it. But it said that, that the deer, the bucks, mature bucks, the older ones that they tagged, cause they were going for older deer when they were collaring mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Would normally be bedded before daylight. Okay. And that they would move between nine and 10. Near, near their bedding area and between 12 and one. And then they would move again after four o'clock, depending yeah. on the buck. So yeah. if it, on average, this is an average. So, but it would be still in that near that bedding area and not like huge travel things. And that their home range is, is a, on average, the home range of a buck in Pennsylvania in this part of Pennsylvania is about a mile, 640 acres. And no matter what the hunting pressure is. It takes a lot to push them out of that home range. It yeah. will just move a little bit to stay away from yeah, that hunting yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah. He said in archery that in archery season, it largely, they didn't see them move a lot because it's a lot of individual archers and staying put on trees yeah, and stuff yeah. like that, where he said, the, the craziest thing is deer are so programmed in this state that two days before the rifle season starts. The deer are already moving to their hiding spots. That's it's crazy. crazy. It's crazy. I mean, that's kind of like my dog, that my, Natalie will say, my wife, she'll say, it's crazy. You were, you were still like three, four minutes down the road and the dog was already at the window, tail wagging, getting crazy. Like they knew that you were coming. Like. Right. So the time, they, yeah. They, well, they know, based on, like they don't wear watches. How the hell do they know what time it is? <laughs> <laughs> but they do. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But yeah. Uh. That that's really good information. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll put, I'll find the link and put it in and, uh, the podcast that he was on 
it was actually because I was checking out some of the Ozonic stuff, uh, one of their videos, and they did a podcast with him. So oh, okay. it was really, they asked him a whole slew of, slew of things that, uh, that you, any hunter would want to know. Right. And they, they asked about barometric pressure, weather, all this stuff. Yeah, he yeah. was like, he was like, they might change movements a little bit with temperature change and, and rain and stuff like that, but largely, largely We're not. And he said, there. kind of a, off the subject thing, I think is really cool that he said, and this is kind of big for hunters too. He said that they have like a mortality thing on the collars. If a deer's in the same spot for so long, it triggers like the deer might be dead because they haven't moved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, but a lot of times, like during bad storms and stuff, deer, the bu big bucks will just stay in the same spot, hunker it's down. hunker down. Yeah. It's hunker down. And he said, they send people out to, to find them. And he said, 99 times out of a hundred, that deer's gone. He said they would be with, cause they also do things where they go out and say, okay, this deer has been collared, collared long enough. We're going to, cause they can remotely disengage the collar and it falls off of them. Oh. But they have to get within like a yeah. hundred yards. And he said that, he said they would take us, put a foot in the woods to go and they'd be, they'd be downwind. Yeah. Right. And everything that deer should not be a smell or anything, but that sound or sight, wherever they're at is enough. And the deer gone. I think we've experienced that a lot on different drives we put on where that you've only put your first foot in the foot in the drive and somebody's shooting. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, so swamp they, they know you're that's like the swamp, swamp donkey drive. That's like that every time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like, boom, and they're, they're moving. You got to so like, think, you know, dad, dad always would say this. He says, we're entering their home. So we're, we're the foreign object in the woods right there in that moment. Yeah. You go in there, you move one thing, you touch a tree, you like when you're walking in, don't be try don't be walking through rubbing on stuff. Don't touch anything. Just. Try and skirt it. So wear gloves if you can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, we're in their house. They know where everything's at. One little thing looks out of place. Nope. They're just winning an opportunity. You're done. It's, yeah. They're, they're I used so to just sappy. I used to just trudge through the woods, get to my yeah. spot and expect to see deer after I made all that noise. And knowing what I know now, the deer's, if the deer were in that area, they're gone. Yeah. So luckily, most of the time, I was thinking that I wanted to get there before they got there. Yeah. And that worked a lot, but now I'm a little bit smarter about it. And no, yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta really sneak in because that little bit of human walking noise, even far off, they can hear that and boom, they're gone. Just crazy how, but the one thing he did say was, Hey, don't give them too much credit. Sometimes they're still sitting there. So not every deer has his own personality. Sometimes they don't yeah, know, yeah. but yeah, but. I mean, there's got to be a dumb one every once in a while. I mean, look <laughs> at humans. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, the dumb, he's, he actually said the dumb <laughs> ones usually don't make it uh, past the third year. So, yeah, Rightfully so. But yeah. So what are yeah. your thoughts here on beginner mistakes for gear selection and prep? You know what? One thing real quick. We talked about spot selection. Yeah. Yep. So as far as the beginner mistake, the one thing I was thinking about before this is goes back to that wind thing is... Making sure when you do select a spot, say it's, you're hunting off of a primary or a community scrape or something, yeah, yeah, or you know there's a good trail between bedding and maybe some water or bedding the food, and make sure you're on the downwind side. And also, yeah. if possible, I mean the the woods never cooperates. You're not necessarily ever going to have the tree in the perfect spot. You might have to adjust and whatever. I try to put myself in that twenty yard range yeah. from that spot that I'm hoping the deer is going to be at. So I put myself in that position and then look at what's my backstop behind me. That, tree, yeah, that deer, yeah. that deer looks up. What's he going to see? Yeah. Oh, it can't always be perfect with that. And that's where I think your, your camo and other stuff comes into play and just staying still. Yeah. Cause, but we're not looking at your watch. Shut up. <laughs> so I had, to, I had, to. had to do it it's going to be every episode no. you had to do it you had to do it i look at my watch once and i'm, I'm an asshole for life yeah you hey <laughs> takes one to know one i guess eh? yeah. <laughs> but anyway so, when it comes to site selection though know, that that wind thing that's your only i mean because you can use scent control as much as you want and i i 
I really do it and to minimize my signature, but I'm still going to smell you because you're going to sweat going in, yeah. you're going to be breathing. So the only, the only thing you have to protect yourself is, is that, that wind or knowing how the thermals are working in that area. So, and, very and not touching anything on the way in rubber boots, rubber things like boots. that. Yeah. Stuff like that. All right. You'll get into the gear, gear stuff. What is that? What's the, what's the beginner mistake? Yeah. It's a gear. beginner mistakes on your gear selection or, or your preparation. Okay. Well, I talked about that, that first hunt I did. Yeah. Right. So I had that crappy bow. I had that. I also bought a, a climber off of eBay. It was a Chinese knockoff climber that was about 32 pounds. So a heavy beast that had no noise suppression whatsoever. It was noisy, banged around. And then when I first got into the tree with it, climbing the tree, it was so rickety that I felt completely unsafe with it. I said to myself, as soon as I was in that tree, I said, oh my God, biggest mistake I made was not getting all my gear together. And I climb a tree two or three times at the climber, but that was without anything. That was just with my clothes on and just, uh, not, not with any of my hunting gear or anything, not pulling the bow up, all that stuff. So I always, now I make sure that I put all my gear on, I go out and I climb a tree two or three times with my full setup before the season. So I know that everything's good. You're still going to screw up at first day. I don't know if anybody doesn't make some mistake first day with, what did Mark say last year? Yeah. He dropped his, he dropped his release. Yeah. And this, I don't know what else. I, was that the you year know before? What? That's, that's the opening season. First day, maybe first two weekend blues. Hey, <laughs> you're, you're rusty. You haven't done it for two thirds of a year. Now, all of a sudden you're back into it again. And, uh, it's, it's like almost, you could be not hungover, but it's like going into, <laughs> well, I'm saying you could, it's like going into the woods hungover almost. You're, you're just. And the beginner's got to understand this. You're going to just, you're going to screw up until you don't anymore. I don't know how else to and, word it. And like, making those, mis making those mistakes <laughs> is a part of growth. You're going to have to, you have to learn somehow. Yes, mistakes absolutely. are going to help you learn. Yeah. But yeah, I was so jacked up. I mean, I got up there. I did, I think, like I said, I was like, okay, I think I had a screw in bow, hold, bow holder and I was like, okay. What side of me is perfect for this? Yeah, I've just, so it took me, like I said, like an hour to get set up because I was totally yeah. unprepared and I took it for granted. And I think it was, I was just being cocky because of my military experience. And that was a, <laughs> a huge mistake. I mean, really yeah. with yeah. my experience, I should have been smarter. And I, yeah. after that though, it was good, good wake up call because then I, I had a whole process. I would get up the tree. I would do this and I would do that. I would do my practice practice shots with my yeah. bow, get my bow out make sure I pull it back and everything's good. I'm checking my ranges. That get tree's that 30 rhythm, yards, man. that tree's yeah. 20. And, and have that system down. And now everything I do is very systematic. I have my, my pack has to be set up a certain way. My sticks go on there one way, my saddles on there, everything's set and I have a system for it. So if you can take anything away from this is make sure you have everything set up. So when you get to the tree, the thing you pull out first out of your pack is the first thing you need, not the last thing you need yes, so that you're systematic yeah. because you can drop stuff out of the tree so easy, especially in the dark, if you're growing up in the mornings or something. So yeah. have a I don't have that plan. problem anymore, but <laughs> when I drop it, it just goes about a foot and a half down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But I've, now, I've done that where I drop my release and in the climber In uh, a climber, you have to actually get the climate down. You can't yeah. just hop out and climb down your sticks real quick and come back up. Like with a saddle with that. So I'd, I'd be like, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting out of the tree early, I guess. Yeah. Yes. But now as far, as far as gear selection, I think Andy said it great last week. Andy said, Hey, a rifle hunter that's going out there for two, three days in the season, maybe four days yeah, or you know, even a week that's, that's, and they're walking out there. They're sitting down with their, their gun. They just have cold weather stuff on and some orange, but archery hunters, man, you're hunting from the first day at the, the first of October through yeah. the end of November, or maybe even second season. He said, he said, having good gear that can last you through the season that you can rely on is the most important thing. That way, the last thing you're thinking about is your gear 
And the only thing you're focused on is the hunt. Yeah. And that's a very smart deal. And so I've, I've tried to adopt that myself Yeah, as well. So for so, me, gear selection, I'll go back to that. I, in the beginning, it, well, I, I had the cheapest stuff known to man. I would get later in the season, I was freezing cold or this, it just seemed like everything was against me because of me. I was not layered enough. I was not, that's a, that's a huge thing when it comes to gear selection. It's not just for me, not just little knickknacks and stuff, your bow hanger and this and that it's the clothing yourself properly for the conditions, having a go bag that you're in your backpack, having a sweatshirt. So you're not sitting there sweating the entire time you're there, or you, you have the sweatshirt for when it, you get colder or just wearing, uh, what's not, not alpaca, but, uh, merino wool socks, keeping that moisture off your feet and keeping the warmth in your boots. And there, there's so much that you're going to learn by the self-inflicted wounds. Uh, that, that yeah. was always the biggest thing for me. Uh, later in the years, I started spending a crap load of money on all the little, the, the hooks for this, the, this, the, that, and, you know, I don't even use that stuff anymore because I'm a ground hunter, but, uh, now as far as the preparation uh you darn well what i was and who i am now i didn't prep at all i was drinking the night before i was either not going out in the morning or i was going out hungover and that is a stupid way to do things and once i woke up and got married and realized that's not the way to do things that's when i started becoming successful it was learning how to prepare and it's not necessarily just about, to me, uh, preparing for, let's say scouting and this and that it's knowing packing for the season, getting ready, taking, having everything with you. That way, when you get up there and go to go out hunting, you're not missing something. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's definitely true. And I think, you know, so as far as, uh, I have like right over here behind me right now, I have my, all my gears laid out. I have everything laid out yes. and I'm going to be doing a full pack out, make sure all my stuff squared away. Um, I think as far as gear lessons learned though, is arrows, once again, you know, said it in the one podcast, your bow doesn't kill the deer, your arrow does. Mm -hmm. And I think my arrows are, are definitely the one thing about this setup though, Dan is, and we took about seven bolts last year. How much money was flung down range? Oh, I don't, so every couple time, hundred dollars, shoot, yeah. every yeah. time I shoot one of those arrows, it's like, oh, it's like 40 bucks with my arrow going, eh, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> one arrow, 40 bucks. Oh, yep. that's horrible. So I put a lot of, a lot of money into my arrows now. And, and, uh, that's, that's a far cry from what I used to do. And I, when I killed deer with those other arrows, I, I look at that, that one and I, uh, I got up there on Beck, Buck Ridge. And they came down out of bedding and I, it was two early season. I think it was the first or first weekend because they were still together in bachelor group. And, uh, I shot my first arrow and I had buck fever, something fierce. <laughs> and, and that arrow went between the deer's legs and he just kind of goes and jumps oh. and just like, he thought it was a twig or something. How'd that go again? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. I can, act, I'm like a fawn. I'm like a fawn. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for it. I just threw you way off track. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it went, it just went between his legs. And now I was like, so ticked off that I was able to calm my nerves. I was ticked off and I was just like pulled up and boom and drilled him. It was always you know, more natural the second shot. Yeah. Oh, it was totally natural yeah. the second shot and what it, what I felt it should have been in the first one. But just like I said, that my level of prep preparation just wasn't, wasn't there. And so I got a good little story about a beginner and that was me. And we went up to state college and we were hunting at Toft Trees Golf Resort. Uh, it's all developed now. There's, you can't hunt it, but back then we went back in there and went hunting and, uh, I'm, it was two ridges that came down there was a little hump in the middle. And I was like, oh, this looks really cool. I'm going to hunt this, this middle hump. 
not thinking about, I'm going to be, if a deer comes down this side, I'm going to be like eye level with it. I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> So lo and behold, I start grunting and I mean, a Jim Dandy of a six point, a bigger than average six point comes tearing ass down over this ridge to me, right to me. I draw, I get a shot at him and I shoot. Now here's where the lesson was. So for the beginners, get a range finder and start range finding trees around you. You know what I mean? So that you know what your distances are. I shot right underneath that thing because I wasn't thinking about that elevation difference between me and him. <laughs> and back then I didn't do the math. I didn't, I didn't care. I was just oblivious. I was, Oh, I'm in the woods. Well, I called dad on the cell phone. Cause we had coverage up there. I was like, Hey, you ain't gonna believe us. He goes, what? You fell out of your tree stand. <laughs> and I was like, no, I just missed the six point. He goes, yeah, well, uh, like almost like he figured he knew how I was hunting at that time. You know what I mean? And he was just like, oh, keep at it, buddy. One of them deals. Mm -hmm. But like, that's just the, the stupid things that, that happen to beginners that you're going to miss opportunities because of you not doing the preparation, your homework. And now for me, one of the first things I do, if the sun's coming up, yep, I'm standing, I'm ready, but I'm also range finding different trees within my little zone. So I know that's 20, that's 30 yards. If he walks Every time. through, if his deer walks through there, that's 25. If his deer walks through there, you, you have to do that. Otherwise mm -hmm. you, you're setting yourself up for failure, but yeah. that, trying to do that when the deer comes in, uh, yeah. there's a, yeah. a lot of times, I mean, a lot of times them buck are on the move and you have seconds to get yeah. drawn without getting busted and get a shot off. You don't have time to be messing with your bow or the, uh, ranges or anything like that. Now, if you have a pin set for it but you yeah. still need to know that range out there or you're going right. to take a bad shot. You can use the bracketing method like I do and, and get a little bit more tuned in, but it doesn't matter. You have to know what that range is because sometimes when you're up in a tree, it can be so, even on the ground, it can be so deceiving sometimes in the woods yeah. at how far something is. Say, so, oh, that's, that's, that's 15 yards. Oh, that's, that's 10. It's things like that. Yeah. So I think one I, of my, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, like going into the, like the, the big, like, what's the next thing here? I, I just happened to look ahead. The biggest difference between 10 years ago till now is that kind of stuff. The small things, you know what I mean? 10 years ago, I was a totally different human being and I was not, I was not willing to put the work in. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't, I didn't have that, that drive that I have now for hunting, the love, the passion for it which back then I was just doing it because everybody else was, I liked the camp life. I liked going <laughs> up and partying at night and da, 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 everything else that came with archery hunting in our little system that we have. But now it's like, I, I, I drank enough beer. I, I partied enough. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to kill deer. It's that's the difference for 10 years ago till now for me. Now, as far as it's like, just one more mistake. And then I'll say the biggest difference for me, which I think we've already talked about, but I'm hunting and, uh, I'm not too far from the road, there, but there's a heck of a trail system there. And it's, it's about four 30 and it gets dark around six at that time. There's yeah. maybe a quarter after six and doesn't a, a, another hunter pull up down the road, get out and walk straight up past me. And right before he, you know, I was like swearing, I heard some movement behind me and I thought, man, there's something coming down through here. And I was like, okay, well, it's, it's gotta be gone now, whatever. And I was frustrated. and was like, oh, and then to make matters worse, the same hunter decides to come down at a uh, quarter till six to go back to his car and leave. I'm like, why did you even come in the woods? What are you doing? And I'm concentrating on him. And I am so focused on him that I just kind of, I have my binos up. I'm looking down at his car and I'm just kind of fuming. This guy just blew the area out for me and ruined my hunt. And I'm like, man, nothing's going to come in here on me. And don't I look down and there is a racker right under my tree. And as soon as I looked down, he was gone. And he I was like, utilize that hunting pressure properly. I was like, I 
I was so focused on that other guy and my frustration. I didn't even think that maybe he could have. There was have, a deer there. It could have influenced the deer to push down to where I was at. Yeah. Because you know, he was kind of a, off to the left of me. And that deer came in from my right for whatever reason. But yeah. I was like, man, I can't believe that. But yeah. as far as, <laughs> but as far as 10 years to now, it's doing exactly what you said. And that's putting the work in. Yeah. I think I enjoy the process of getting ready for archery season and scouting out in the woods and being out in the woods and scouting around. Just you as know, much even as more the than I like to hunt. hunt. Yeah. I, I, I love that whole process. Yeah. It's turning into a, a year long process for me. And I love that. I mean, I yeah. just, just love it. Yeah. And it's getting to the point where you, you understand that process and enjoy yeah. it and understand it, uh, what it takes to be successful to get a real big buck. If you don't care about getting a real big buck, I mean, that's your prerogative. You can shoot a two, three-year-old six point and be happy. Every, yeah. Your your degree of happiness is based on what you want to do, not what somebody else tells you. Exactly. Yeah. So I've shot a five point before and was ecstatic, yeah. ecstatic because of how hard it is to hunt where we hunt to even see a buck, yeah. let alone, let alone see a big one. So as I've gradually gotten better at my hunting, the more I've focused on trying to challenge myself as opposed to shooting a smaller deer. I won't shoot a smaller deer right now unless I was going to shoot a smaller deer at the end of last season because my wife broke her leg and, and my, my season effectively yeah. basically stopped October 16th. So, <laughs> but I was ready to shoot a six plus the few days I got to hunt after that. Yeah, but in rifle season, you shot a doe right in the eyeball. That was pretty gnarly. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I ran over and gutted your deer for you. I was so happy. <laughs> bitch, bitch was looking at me weird. Yeah. <laughs> so no, never that do was that a, again. <laughs> yeah. That, that was just a weird, a weird thing. I felt yeah. bad. You know, I had a 243. And, and just like I just, we just said, you guys had literally just barely started that drive. Yeah. And you called over the radio, hey, we're starting. And I think yeah. it was, how long was that after, after you started that I shot? Mike, I wasn't that far from you because I was looking for bullet holes in me when you started shooting out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, sh you were shooting kind of my direction too, which was a little scary, but I mean, down yeah. at an angle, you weren't shooting there, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. I was shooting. My, my rounds are going into the ground <laughs> Yeah, yeah. from the angle I was at. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. of my wife breaking her leg, I, we, we got out that, we always do kind of a last day of rifle season hunt for fun yeah. and get a bunch of people together at camps and stuff to have a good time. So yeah. we go out in the morning, we put some drives on and boom, these guys start a drive and no sooner they start to drive and I see a shadow of a, of a doe walking out in front of me through some thick brush and she stops and she's kind of looking behind her and I'm afraid she's going to bolt. So I said, I'm shooting through the brush. So I shot through the brush, hit her, hit her good. But afterwards we saw it was a yeah, perfect yeah, shot. Yeah, it was a good hit. Yeah. And she ran away from me as she's running. I shot again, right, right through her as she ran, which also was a good shot. Yes. And she went down. She went sure. down. So thinking, okay, got her. She's laying over there. I can see her about, I don't know, was that? 60, 60 yards. 60, 70 yards, whatever it was. And. So then you're coming through the woods, coming down, uh, your oh, the drive's about done. Yeah. And I just catch it moving out of, out of my eye, left eye. And I just kind of look over and her head's up and she's laying down she, and I'm like, oh my God, she's laying over there suffering. So I pull my gun up <laughs> right through the eye. Um, she was, she was done then. I walked you know, right up. I, I walked. I hated. I hated out. knowing that. I hated knowing she was suffering. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I walked right down like, that drive, right into her. And <laughs> oh, that last shot, the, the eye shot, was the one that I was really looking for bullet holes in me. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. Like, hey, let's keep going. <laughs> so I walk out, and there she was laying. And I, I didn't even know who shot at that point. I look over, and there you were. And I was like, uh, he was making his way over. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to start gutting her for him. <laughs> got the knife out and you could, by the time you got to me, I had already had her gutted out for you. See, that's because I love you, brother. <laughs> that's, what, that's what brothers do. See? <laughs> so, so there's something more to that though, that the audience doesn't know is that we talk a lot of smack and, and, and you put on a show for the old man to get him to gut a deer recently. <laughs> True or false. <laughs> 
True. <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and, I'm a little uh, worked up, Dad. I can't do it. <laughs> so, so then I think I said something like, if I get a buck, you've got to gut my deer. If I get a buck before you, you've got to gut my deer. And then he did. And that was a previous season. Previous yep. season. I got a buck and we went out and he gutted my deer. This is the bet. <laughs> and uh, after we found it. And uh, that was the time we were, we were tracking. And, I, and you were saying, I'm not seeing any blood. I'm like, Dan, look at the trees. Dude, it was sprayed everywhere. It was like... <laughs> It was like Texas Chainsaw Massacre just happened. I'm like, how can you not, how can you not see this? It's all over the tree, Ooh. both sides. But yeah. And then, so fast forward, I basically, I said to Dan, I said, I said, you should gut my deer. And he goes right over there and does it. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, you had a rough season. It was the least I could do for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Then we had, your, then we had your, to drag it across the Breaking her ankle was a pretty uh, catastrophic event. It, yeah, that, that I was telling her today, she, she was going over to a memorial. A friend of hers uh, had passed away, and she went over to the memorial. And I said, "Hey, remember, you drive fifty-five, maybe even fifty. <laughs> Be safe. Stay in the <laughs> stay in the right lane. Don't pass anybody, <laughs> and keep things calm. <laughs> we are not screwing up this archery season. <laughs> All right, lessons learned, man." <laughs> <laughs> You gotta put that woman in a bubble, like make her yeah. a bubble girl, like <laughs> bubble wrap, yeah, She's bubble wrap, bubble wrapped up for sure, mm. yeah. So, what do you think? You want to put a bow on this, man? Yep, I think so. It's a good, All right. so like a pretty good episode here. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, if you don't know already, we have the Everyday Bow Hunter website and you know, all our social media channels, Everyday Bow Hunter. But uh, I am also the owner of ArcheryHunting.com, which is also called the Everyday Bow Hunter. So, uh, a lot of the things we talk about here. In fact, the majority of what we talk about here, I have content on the web website that you can use in detail, but it's all there on the site. We have arrow calculators to teach you how to build out your arrows and all kinds of stuff. So go over to archeryhunting.com, uh, get some of that content. I really appreciate the, the visit and stuff. Help me out. We are not sponsored by anybody. You might get some free gear here and then there to test, but we're not getting paid by anybody. We're doing this because we love it. Yeah. We're doing it for the everyday bow hunter, right? So yeah. Dan? Amen. So yeah, thanks to everybody. Hit that like button, subscribe, give us a five star review. If you can, will. <laughs> uh got any questions, send them in. Uh thanks again. We appreciate you. Have a good night. <laughs>